that yesterday we lost one of our sisters. Um, her name was Shawana Baumgart, Baumbart, rather, mm -hmm. and she passed away from lupus in her early 30s, correct? Yes. So um, would you like to say something, Sh Kawana, sure, sure. about her? Okay. So Shawana had been a part of Sisters Against Lupus since the very beginning, so for the last four years, um, and she has battled lupus for a number of years, and um, but just so full of life, and you wouldn't, obviously, like most of us, you can't tell by looking at, at us that she battled lupus. Um, she had multiple complications with lupus. Um, just recently, she had issues with her years and so um, I'm delighted to have known such a phenomenal person and to have had her a part of our organization. Um, one thing about us we are more than an organization we are a family and so it's difficult to lose one of our sisters so um, we'd like to just have a brief moment of silence in her honor. Thank you. So this experience reminds us why we're in this room today. Uh, lupus, as everyone in this room knows, is a very devastating, terribly difficult disease. And we're here because there is hope. There is hope, and the hope comes through research. And that is one of the reasons why we're so pleased to be able to present some extremely distinguished and brilliant researchers today, as well as a rather extraordinary young woman who will help um, people with lupus understand how to manage their disease. So it's a very exciting program. We have a lot to do, so we're gonna try and keep our opening comments quite short. I just wanna tell you a little bit about the Lupus Foundation of America Pacific Northwest Chapter. Our mission is to improve the quality of life for all people affected by lupus through programs of research, education, advocacy, and support. And our vision is a life free of lupus. Kawana, is there anything more that you would like to say about Sisters Against Lupus? Sure, I, I think the reason why this partnership works so well is that we, our missions and visions are obviously um, a lot similar. So Sisters Against Lupus was established four years ago just as a way um, we saw within the community that we needed more advocacy. We needed more awareness about this disease. So we came together and formed this foundation and have been partnering with LFA for a couple of years now. So we're excited to yes. be here and thank you all for being here today. Yes, we're really grateful for your, your coming. As I mentioned, the reason for today's symposium is because there's so many terrific strides being made in research. And I really believe that everyone is interested in research. And that is where, as I said earlier, the hope lies. So um, at, in the first part of the program, we're gonna be presenting two um, research physicians who are gonna be talking about the latest in lupus research and their areas, in areas of interest in particular. And then the second part of the program, we're gonna be talking more. We have a scientist from BRI and we have our wonderful health coach talking more about what you can do, what people with lupus can do in terms of promoting awareness and working towards better treatments, better understanding of the disease and eventually a cure. May not happen in our lifetimes, but eventually if we are all committed enough to caring, spreading the word, raising the money, Getting the research done, eventually, we hope there will be a cure. So each presenter will have about 25 minutes, 20 to 25 minutes to talk. And then at the end of each presentation, there'll be about five to 10 minutes for, for people to ask questions. So please um, don't save your questions till the end because some of our, our pres presenters are leaving. Um, they have wonderful family activities they must get to. Uh, Dr. Hughes' daughter is, is competing in a soccer 
um, playoff today. So that is super, I mean, you know, that really is important. So <laughs> it trumps being with us. I mean, da being a dad is very important. Um, so I just want you to note that you should each have a program and um, an evaluation form. We have pencils as well. If you would like to uh, use a pencil to fill out the evaluation form at the end of the program, we very much would appreciate your taking a few moments to let us know what you thought about the program, how we can improve, what other subjects you would like to see um, our organizations address in the future. Um, if you forget and take it home, if you could mail it back, just Google us and find our addresses and mail it back to us, that would be fantastic. And now it's time for thank yous. Um, first and foremost, we'd like to thank the Better Royer Research Institute for sponsoring this event. Go BRI. Yes. We were at their luncheon yesterday. It was awesome. Go UW too, all right? <laughs> <laughs> you know I have a special place in my heart for the UW and Children's Hospital. And um, we also want to thank Virginia Mason Medical Center for letting us use this fabulous hall. Um, I'm, I'm going to thank James Kruger our tech guy of Slow Motion Studios. Hannah, and applause, please. Where's Katie? Okay. And Lynn. All right, thank you guys. We, we could not run LFA PNW without our volunteers. And Kiwana even more so because Sisters Against Lupus does not have a staff. So everyone is a volunteer. Yes. Right, so we're super grateful for all of you for making this event happen. Um, of course, we wanna thank our honored speakers and presenters, we are so delighted and thrilled and grateful that you have chosen to spend a few hours with us this afternoon. And um, I would like to thank Valerie Backus, who is with the Lucky Seven Foundation, who gave us a grant of $5,000, which enabled us to present this symposium and two others that are coming up as well. Um, Kawana, do you wanna just say this? Oh, sure. <laughs> I have a speaking part. Let's see. Um, no, we just really wanted to thank you all for coming out, especially those that are actually living with lupus. We do understand what it's like to, I personally know what it's like to um, barely sleep at night and not want to get up out of bed and, and all that stuff. So for you to be here today to want to learn more and um, we're just glad to have you here and thank you to our doctors and, and all the educators that are here today to um, teach us more about this disease that we're fighting. So thank you all. And then, um, thanks Kawana. Yeah, we know it's hard sometimes just to get out of bed. So to get out of bed, get dressed and be here, that's a really big deal. So thank you. <laughs> so now I would like to introduce Lori Campbell. Lori, are you ready? Lori is um, our indomitable chair. She is absolutely an extraordinary woman, the chair of the Lupus Foundation of America Pacific Northwest Chapter. She has the honor of introducing our first speaker. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Celia and Kawana. Good afternoon, everyone. And as they said, we're so happy that everyone could come out this afternoon and join us. That is quite okay, James. Um, could come out this afternoon and join us. And as Celia and Kawana said, that we know what it's like to live with lupus and we truly appreciate any educational symposium that we can put on to help everyone who's involved with that person's life who is living with lupus. So I also want to say thank you to the friends and the family of those who support us every single day in our daily struggle of dealing with this disease. Now I would like to have the pleasure of introducing our first guest speaker, who is Dr. Grant Hughes. Dr. H Grant Hughes is a University of Washington, Washington assistant professor in the Division of Rheumatology and the Acting Section Chief 
for Rheumatology at Harborview Medical Center. He is board certified in internal medicine and rheumatology. He has an treatments and diagnostics tests. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Grant Hughes. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, Laurie, for that uh, fabulous introduction. And uh, thank you, uh, Celia and Kiwana, for inviting me to, to speak here today. It's terrific to see so many people here to, to discuss and learn about such an important topic. And I guess there's also people watching uh, via the internet on live stream. Um, uh, and to share with me um, a topic that I've, I've been, it's captured my imagination and interest since I first began medical training um, in the uh, late 1990s. So today I'm going to talk about a sort of an age-old question, is why does lupus affect women so much more often than men? Um, sort of a, it's a neglected question, but it uh, has gathered some steam in terms of research in the last 10, 15 years. And I'm not going to talk so much about my own work. I, you know, what I do is just a small sliver of, of the mystery, but I'm going to summarize what a lot of other people much smarter than me have figured out over the last few years and give you a bigger picture. Um, and hopefully also identify, really highlight the fact that there's a ton more work to be done in this, this particular area. Here are my financial disclosures. I'm going to start with a story. And we'll call this person Sophia. It's not her real name. Um, and it's not her real picture. But I think this photograph captures the, the youth and vitality of of most lupus patients, most people with lupus. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story. Sophia is a healthy 21-year-old college student. And, and this is a story from early in my medical training. And I, I just wanted to, 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 to tell it to you now. She had two brothers, or has two brothers who are healthy. And in the spring, starts developing fevers, achy joints, chest pain, and a rash. By late April, she starts hearing voices. She's confused. She has to drop out of school, and she's worried that people are trying to hurt her. And then later, features of the X and Y chromosomes, and we'll go into, into this in a bit more detail. So in order to understand how gender could influence risk of lupus, we need to understand some of the basics of lupus biology. 
And lupus, as I think a lot of us know, is an autoimmune disease. That means the immune system, which is normally there to protect us against infections, turns against our own health, our own body. And in lupus, the autoimmune attack is directed against the nucleus of the cell, shown here at the core of this diagram. And the nucleus is a component of all living cells. Now, the immune system can't see the nucleus inside a cell, but when cells die or turn over, which happens in all of our tissues on a daily basis, the, uh, in a person with lupus, the immune system can recognize the nucleus. And here's a picture of some dead cells under a microscope um, where the, a lupus patient's uh, antibodies have been tagged with a green fluorescent dye. You can see they're just attacking these nuclei. And so, um, because dead and dying cells are present in our bloodstream and in our tissues on a regular basis, uh, it can trigger immune attack in patients with lupus. And, and the immune attack can, can be in any part of the body, the joints, the skin, the kidneys, the lungs, or even the brain. And so it's not so much that lupus is targeting each individual organ for attack, it's that it's targeting components that are common to all tissues of the body. And that's an important point in lupus. So, in the, in, at least in this country, about nine out of 10 patients with lupus are female. And that's um, um, a pattern that's repeated in lots of other autoimmune diseases, as you can see in this diagram on, on the right. But lupus is among the most female predominant of the autoimmune diseases. And the reasons behind this are still not really well understood. Um, but this is an important question to answer because simply being female is a major risk factor for lupus. And so identifying how gender interacts with risk of lupus will identify some of the most common reasons that people get lupus. It also impacts how reproductive health is, it, is uh, it, um, given to people with lupus or at risk for lupus. And by understanding how hormones may increase or even decrease,
white blood cells. And how this works is we take a molecule that will bind to PDL1. So say this cell has PDL1 on the surface, this molecule will only bind to PDL1, only this one protein, it won't bind to any other proteins. And we tag it with a fluorescent marker. So this cell doesn't have any PDL1, and none of these fluorescent molecules will bind to it. They only bind to the cells that have PDL1 on them. Then we run these through um, what we call a flow cytometer, and we have um, six of these at Seattle Children's Research Institute. Um, and what the flow cytometer does is shines this fluorescent light at one cell at a time. And then there's another, um, sorry, there's a laser that, sh that, that activates the fluorescence of this green marker. And then there's a fluorescent light detector here. So it looks at each cell one at a time. We can look at thousands and thousands of cells this way in a few minutes. Um, and it tells us how many of the cells express PDL1 and how much PDL1 is there on every single cell. So we've done this with, with cells from patients with lupus who are flaring up, patients that are not flaring up, and then um, um, healthy people so that we can compare the difference. And what we see is, so this is the number of cells expressing PDL1, and this is how much PDL1. So a cell over here expresses a lot of PDL1, and this cell expresses barely any, and these cells um, express an average uh, medium amount of PDL1. And what you can see is in remission, the cells produce a lot of PDL1. So this represents thousands and thousands of cells. In a patient with lupus flare, the PDL1 is way low. So the average amount of that protein on each of the cell from the lupus patients is way lower. So they're missing their stop signal. And what we know is that patients with infection have a lot of PDL1 on the surface. Com and especially compared to lupus flare, but even higher than, um, than healthy people. Patients with rheumatoid arthritis, very high PDL1. Multiple sclerosis, very high PDL1. Every other autoimmune disease looks like very high PDL1. Only lupus is low for this stop signal. So we'd like to make this into a test that we could use in the clinic. Um, so that when we have a patient that comes in, we can ask, what's the PDL1 looking like? Is it high? Well, it's probably infection. We should go with the antibiotics. Is it low? We sh it's probably a lupus flare. We should give them steroids. Um, are we there yet? Not quite. Developing a new test, we have to be very careful, to only to use it if we've proven that it's going to be helpful for most of the people. So here's how it works. First, we have to patent it and license it. And this is because if we're going to have a test that's going to be used all across the country or the world, somebody's got to make money from it. And the way you do that is to, to patent it. So we patent it and we license it out to a, to a company that does these tests all around called Quest Diagnostics. So they have lots and lots of tests. They have clinics everywhere where they can draw blood and they can do these tests. So they have it, but that's not good enough. It's on the market, but we should not be using it because we've not proven in adult patients, in thousands of patients with infection, without, without infection, with lupus flare, without lupus flare, that it really works in a lot of people. I mean, who knows? Maybe it's only going to work in women. Maybe it's only going to work in men. We have to do a lot more work before we can actually use this in the clinics. We have to prove that the test works over and over the same way in the same person. If you take the same sample and do the test 10 times, are you going to get the exact same answer? Um, we need to test this in multiple populations, in Asians, in blacks, in whites, in all different, you know, in, in Florida, in Seattle. We have to test it to so see if it works in, in, in different populations. And um, then we have to do all the statistics behind it. How many diagnoses are we going to miss if we rely on this? How many times is a patient really going to have affection, an infection and we're going to be wrong based on the PDL1 test? So we're currently trying to raise the funds to be able to do these large studies to test, to, to really scientifically test this clinical um, test. So what I've tried to talk to you about is, is what are the worst outcomes in lupus patients? Infection, um, from what I can tell. Um, and how can we prevent this morbidity and mortality from infection? We need early tests. And we, I'm hoping that PDL1 will help us to differentiate these patients. So this is one part of our, um, the work we do in our lab. 
And of course, I can only do work on one project at a time and be able to really move it forward. I'm only one person. Dr. Hughes is one person. We're working as fast as we can, but <laughs> my other mission is to try to get everyone to study lupus. And so this is how I'm doing this. <laughs> and, um, um, there's really great opportunities in the city of Seattle and the state of Washington to, um, to try to, to get um, scientists and physicians in different areas interested in lupus and get them to put efforts into these problems too. So um, at the Fred Hutch, I have a Starler Oncology there. Um, there's a wonderful immunology lab who's interested in that T cell reaction to the tumors I told you about. Veronica Groh and Thomas Spies, they're very renowned immunologists who study very basic immunology. They were studying a molecule that they found is important in this T cell response to tumors. And I started looking at it and mm, maybe this is interesting in lupus. Took cells out of my freezer, bring them over to Fred Hutch, they tested them, she's published two papers on it already. Looks like their molecule on T cells is gonna be a very important marker in lupus as well. Um, and she's working on a third paper right now. Dentistry, what the heck? Why would dentistry have anything to do with this? Infectious diseases. We are working with the School of Dentistry to, um, to work on this issue of the microbiome. So how does our immune system get regulated by all these bacteria in our mouths that activate the immunity in our mouths and in our guts? There's billions and billions of bacteria in our intestines that are interacting with our immune systems every day. And we don't really understand which bacteria are good, which ones are bad. How can we change this and how can we regulate the immune system better through changing the bacteria in our mouths, maybe th through specific antibiotic rinses, maybe through prebiotics, maybe through nutrition, which will feed the bacteria differently. It's very early science, but I think it's super important. So we're just starting to collaborate with um, um, not only th these folks, but also the gastroenterologists who are studying these immune system um, in the gut interactions. Genetics, we work with um, the Center for Human, Human Genome Sciences at the University of Washington, who are involved in a massive um, project sequencing whole genomes. And so we are collecting at Seattle Children's families um, who have multiple members with autoimmune diseases such as lupus. And we are able to take the DNA from these family members um, and send them to the University of Washington so they can sequence the whole genome so that we can identify new genes that um, may be involved and may be important targets for therapy. Pregnancy, <laughs> so glad you brought that up. Um, I've been studying for a number of years this concept of um, fetal microchimerism and maternal microchimerism. And what that is, is during pregnancy, cells pass back and forth between the mother and the child. And fetal cells, mainly male cells, have been found in women with lupus and mother cells have been found in kids with lupus. And we're studying um, whether the T cells may be rec recognizing these foreign cells as, as foreign and different and getting activated by them and, this, and causing this chronic inflammation. If we can identify that, and that may be partly what's going on um, in, during pregnancy in um, women with lupus is that the fetal cells, and I don't know of any data specifically um, addressing this male versus female fetus, um, but, um, but the cells probably are activating the immune system of the, of the woman, and once the baby's born, then that high number of cells is not there anymore. Um, so that's one aspect of pregnancy, but the other as aspect of pregnancy, which came as sort of a surprise, was through the PDL1 work. So it turns out the most PDL1 that's made in the whole body is not on those monocyte cells, it's in the placenta during pregnancy. And so this is, this, is, this is how the placenta turns off the mother's immune system, those T cells in the mother that could be going into the fetus and attacking the fetus too, like a tumor. The PDL1 gets made in the placenta and it kills off those mother's T cells, it stops them, it gives them the stop sign. So I started thinking, well, if, if the, the patients with lupus have low PDL1 in their blood, 
do the women, do they partly have problems with the pregnancies because of low PDL1 in the placenta? And so I called a couple of the women in New York, the rheumatologists who do leading lupus pregnancy work, and asked them if they could send me some placentas. And they didn't have any. For years, decades, they've been doing these studies, and they had no placentas saved up. Um, so luckily, at Seattle Children's, we actually have a pro program called GAPS, Global Alliance Against Prematurity and Stillbirth. And they are um, enrolling women during pregnancy and collecting blood samples during the pregnancy, and then at birth, collecting blood from the baby, blood from the mother, and placenta tissue. So we can study this PDL1 issue in the blood samples from and, and in the placenta tissues from women with lupus, women with rheumatoid arthritis, healthy women, and see if this is true. And um, they've been enrolling patients with lupus for us for about a year now, and we've got four um, samples so far, and it looks like they are low in PDL1. So it's early pilot project, but through GAPS, I'm hoping that we'll be able to expand this into a larger project and really study the very specific immune system proteins in the placenta that are regulating these pregnancies. And if so, maybe we can make a molecule that would replace PDL1 um, activity and inhibit those T cells and calm the immune system down during pregnancy. So that's my mission, get everybody to study, uh, study lupus, and this is my final uh, final effort, and this is a um, collaboration that we have, um, oh, that's the lupus placenta data, I forgot to put it in there, it's there, you're the first to see this. <laughs> that's the amount of um, PDL1 in placentas from lupus patients versus rheumatoid arthritis patients and controls. And some of these are diabetes patients and they're actually quite high. Coming soon. So the final bit is um, interactions with nephrologists. So um, about three years ago, a company called me and they were interested in um, looking at cells from patients with a vasculitis, so other kinds of diseases that cause inflammation of blood vessels. They had a new drug that they thought would, would um, block T cells in patients with vasculitis and multiple sclerosis, where there's two diseases. So I started looking at the type of T cells that they were talking about where this drug might bind. And there are a few papers in lupus patients where this, this, this type of cell and this protein is blocking is definitely there in lupus and important in T cell function in lupus. So I started talking to him about, did you know about lupus? Did you, uh, let me tell you about lupus. And, <laughs> and by the end of a couple of years, they agreed that lupus was a very good target for this brand new drug. And this led to um, the new Alliance for Children's Therapeutics. And what this is, is a new effort at Seattle Children's to collaborate with industry to try to move drugs to the market quicker. We want them in the pediatric market, of course. I want them in the lupus market, where they're going to be good for everybody with lupus, hopefully. Um, but we're going to do, we speed this up. And it's, um, what we're doing is using philanthropy through Children's Hospital, so funds that we have in the Research Institute, and get investors that are investing in the company and putting these two pots of money together to try to move the whole thing faster. So this drug quickly is called SHK186, fancy name. It's from C. anemone venom, um, and it targets these very specific T cells, so it doesn't wipe out the whole immune system, but only these super activated T cells that are causing the harm. Um, and we're in early studies where we're collecting urine from lupus patients um, right now at Seattle Children's and hopefully soon at Harborview and the university um, where we can um, find the white blood cells in the urine of the patients with lupus nephritis. So the white blood cells are attacking the ki kidneys and they get spilled out into the urine. So that's where the action is. We, those are the cells that we're studying. And we're going to test whether this, this drug binds them and blocks those. If it looks like the, patient, the cells from the lupus patients are actually responding to this drug, then um, that would be grounds to, for moving on to a clinical trial for lupus nephritis. So it's really exciting to me to see something sideways pushed towards lupus that otherwise would not have been. Um, much of this uh, work in the PDL1 early on was supported by the Lupus Foundation. So we're, we get support from various foundations, but um, this, the PDL1 work was, was initially the pilot studies were possible because of Lupus Foundation funding. So thanks again to everyone here for working so hard for these 
patients. And this is just showing um, where we are. Seattle Children's is not up at Children's Hospital. The, the research institute is on 9th and Stewart, right across from where the old Greyhound bus station was. This is where Dr. Hughes is in, at the University of Washington buildings right near Lake Union. And the Fred Hutch is over here. And we are up here. And we all walk back and forth to each other's laboratories and, and seminars and things. So we're very interactive among the different research groups. And I invite anyone who wants to come to Seattle Children's Hospital and tour the laboratories and learn more about what we're doing, I'd be happy to host you. Well, thank you very much, and I'd um, love to have a question or two. <laughs> question. Prothrombin mutations, I do not know. Do you know, Dr. Hughes? No. Are you thinking about the clotting part of the, I mean, we certainly see antibodies that block thrombin, th prothrombin activity and predispose to blood clots, but um, I don't know about mutations in them. That's not one of the genes that pops up as one of the highest candidate genes in these whole genome studies, but that doesn't mean it's not important. Can you repeat the question? Oh, okay, yes. Why does the treatment for a patient with lupus differ from state to state? I would go further than that. The treatment for lupus differs from rheumatologist to rheumatologist. Even at Seattle Children's Hospital, we have 10 pediatric rheumatologists. You would probably get a slightly different treatment depending on which rheumatologist you went to. Other factors are, of course, insurance approval, um, which we try not to let us let affect us at all. We do the best science, but the other issue is that there's not a lot of good science, especially in children. There has never been a clinical trial for children with lupus, ever. So this lupus nephritis one, if, if we do this, if there's grounds for it, then that would be the first one ever. So we're, it, for children, we're just guessing based on the small amount of data we have from adult <coughs> clinical trials. And the adult clinical trials, they're very limited. I mean, there, a lot of them don't take patients with nephritis, so they're patients that are not as sick or being, so we know what the side effects and the, and the efficacy of the treatment is for this set of patients, but all the patients that we see in clinic are completely different. So it's lack of science, it's different opinions, and insurance coverage. Yes, sir. Um, so you've not been able to synthesize PBL on given intravenously. Ah, yeah. So, so what do we need to do to develop a PDL1 replacement drug? Um, it's tricky in that the, if we just make a molecule by itself, it doesn't work. It would bind to the cell. It needs to be a group of molecules, probably attached to a bead. Um, there have been animal studies where they make a cell that makes a lot of PDL1. If you put that cell into the lupus mouse, it works pretty well. But we're not at that point where we can do the gene therapy for the PDL1. There is a group at the, um, and, 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 and I bring this up when I talk to people in biotech a lot, and what they tell me is it's easy to make a blocking antibody, like, you know, something like Enbrel or Humira or Benlista, that something that blocks is pretty easy, make a big old molecule that just interferes with it. To make a molecule that actually acts and would bind to the T cell and make that f function happen is really hard. So we still want to do it, and there's a group at the university who makes um, um, peptides, and they, they've synthesized a whole bunch of peptides that bind to the receptor for pdl one on the T cells, and so we're working with them, and the folks here at Virginia Mason are also working with them to screen all of these and see. Some of them might block, some of them might activate, and so I think that's probably going to, way, going to be the way to go. Maybe those little peptides, the little small molecules that will do the job, or attaching them to a synthetic kind of um, latex bead kind of molecule that we could use as the drug. Yes? Um, I have heard nothing about um, like hemolytic anemia. Is there any research done in the in, 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 in that condition? 
and specifically on hemolytic anemia. We, my lab doesn't do any research that's specifically for hemolytic anemia. Um, what's new in the area? The, w the one thing that comes to mind is that um, a, a friend of mine that works at the University of Florida has a mouse model where he is looking at these receptors that are responses to infections called like toll-like receptor and um, defects in those and he's found very specific defects in genes in, the, uh, um, in mice that some, some get lupus, some just get hemolytic anemia. So it's kind of cool that he's developed this mouth, mouse model because now he can test treatments for this aspect of lupus. And I think that's kind of where the, the field with using animal models is going, is taking apart all the different aspects of lupus, because patients don't have all the parts of, you know, everything in lupus. They might just have hemolytinemia, they might just have nephritis, um, might just have arthritis. So, um, so he's doing that that way. What we're doing at Seattle Children's is a little bit different, where Taking, um, we're making mice that have these tiny little gene defects. So we say this gene contributes this much risk to it. It's not a deletion of the gene. It's not a total destruction of the gene usually. It's just a little change in the DNA, one or two um, nucleotides in the DNA. So we're making mice that have these tiny little changes and we'll be able to test and see which parts of lupus these mice get. Yes? I do not know a connection with the air genes. It's an interesting question. Um, and I have no idea what PDL1 is doing in patients with multiple autoimmune diseases. That no one has no one has studied those patients. such a problem. It's such a problem. And, and it goes both ways. And we see a lot of patients in the rheumatology clinic who come in because they have an ANA and the family is terrified they have lupus. But 10% of normal healthy children um, have an ANA. So the ANA itself is not a diagnosis of lupus. Um, if the ANA is pretty low or negative, it's unlikely that, that it is lupus. But like you say, there are 11 criteria. Um, do you need to have four of those criteria in order to have lupus? No, those criteria are set out for, for um, research studies so that we're all talking about the same thing in a research study. So you have to, to publish a research study, you have to use those criteria. Patients have to have four out of the 11. But if I had a patient that had a really high ANA, had antibodies to double-stranded DNA, and had ulcers on the roof of the mouth, that's only three, and that patient has lupus. So it really depends on the whole clinical picture, but um, I don't think we, we're really very good at being precise in diagnosing lupus. And we're still in a position where we're based on our experience and best guesses. So we need better tests. It'd be great if we could have a genetic test. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Thank you so much, Anne. We appreciate the presentation. Right now, everybody, we're just going to take a short break, and then we will proceed on with our program. Yeah, and I just, I'd just like to add that we do have an information table um, out in the front area where you registered. So please make sure that you pick up some um, some information. I know there's some from BRI there, and um, some from the Lupus Foundation of America as well. And there's some cookies that are non-gluten, and there's some other healthy snacks, fruit and um, veggies. 
So, and for those of you who are live streaming, take a break and get some snack too. Okay.
but I don't want them to show up there. What is it? F8 or something? Oh, okay, that works. <laughs> I think. Remind myself what I'm talking about.
throw you for a minute. Where you would normally be speaking, right? And this is a really wide angle camera, so okay. I'm gonna come in a little bit closer and I just need to use you. I think you would be speaking right there in front of the microphone. Thank you. You're a good height. You're a good height. <laughs> Five nine, aren't you? Uh Five eight-ish. Oh, sorry. You still want me here? <laughs> yep. Okay. He was asking me to stand here to like test the height. <laughs> this is working. Oh, it's not on yet. Yeah, do we know how to turn it back on? Because Neil, well, Neela, shut up. Here's Neela. everyone can you please take your seats we need to um, have the second half of this program we're so I'm so in awe of the two presentations we have heard we are very very fortunate to be here in the Pacific Northwest where we have some extraordinary researchers um, could someone please Neela, can you tell those people to come in there are people out still chatting in the hallway <laughs> we want we want to get them in. No? All right. So let's start. Um, before Dr. Salate speaks, um, she's going to be introduced by a wonderful young woman who is the future of lupus research. Oh, excuse me. Could you just make sure that Dr. Salate Where is she? Oh, there you are. Excellent. Okay. So we are very privileged and honored to have on the board of the Lupus Foundation of America Pacific Northwest Chapter, Dr. Katie Moore. Katie Moore. And Katie is a rheumatology fellow at Children's Hospital here in Seattle. And she is, has been mentored by Ann Stevens. And she's an amazing board member, incredible advocate, wonderful fundraiser, and an inc a, a fantastic doctor. And we're very, very grateful to have Katie on our board. So, Katie, now the microphone is yours. Thank you, Celia. Um, so I just wanted to have the pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sarah Saletti, um, who is now at the Benaroya Research Institute. She actually initially started her research in infectious disease back on the East Coast at the University of Rochester, and then went on um, to move to us in Seattle and has made her way first through Fred Hutch um, and then ultimately to Benaroya in 95, and I'm looking really forward to hearing what she has to say. inviting me to talk about um, the work that we do at Benaroya Research Institute. It's really a privilege and um, an 
inspiration to be here with you today because you're the reason that I do research and to be here with you today and hear your questions and uh, just, you know, see uh, the human side of um, autoimmunity really inspires me and encourages me to keep working um, in this area. Um, so it occurred to me when I was uh, putting this talk together that um, not all of you uh, may get your health care at Virginia Mason. So you may, and even if you do get your health care at Virginia Mason, you may not know about the Benamoria Research Institute. So I think I'm going to start by giving you a little background about uh, BRI. And then I'm going to tell you about a really important aspect um, of what we do there, which are our biorepositories and how that's helping to move um, research in lupus and all autoimmune diseases forward. So um, at BRI, our focus is autoimmunity. And um, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here when I tell you that there are more than 80 autoimmune diseases and they have um, strike one um, in 20 Americans. And they're among the top 10 causes of death in children and women who are 65 years of age and younger. And you heard um, so nicely from uh, Dr. Hughes earlier about, uh, or sorry, Dr. Grant earlier about the uh, um, sexual dimorphism and the um, uh, women be effect being affected far more often than men. Uh, so, um, and that's really, uh, really a picture of the disease and then of course the cost of um, caring for uh, people with autoimmunity both for therapies and interventions. So this is a list of some of the autoimmune diseases and the diseases that are uh, highlighted in red are the diseases that we specifically work on at uh, Benaroya Research Institute and um, we are affiliated with Virginia Mason, and we're located right on the corner of 9th Avenue and uh, Seneca Street. So when you pull out of this building, you'll see our building when you're leaving today. So um, take a look for us. And as I said, our focus is on autoimmune diseases, and we have uh, projects that are in type 1 diabetes, allergy, asthma, lupus, MS, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, relapsing polychondritis, scleroderma, and ulcerative colitis, and we've also um, made a foray into celiac disease recently. And um, just a little bit about who we are at BRI. So we're a relatively small research institute, but we have 50 uh, plus years of scientific experience. Um, we have 275 staff members, including 27 principal investigators who uh, run research through their own labs. We have a, um, a nearly $50 million research volume in 2013 and um, $67 million for 2014. And one of the key things that we um, have at BRI is that our director, Dr. Jerry Nepom, who some of you may know, um, had, was appointed several years ago to be the director of the Immune Tolerance Network through the um, National Institutes of Health. And so we now also have, uh, we're now also the home for the um, ITN, as we call it. We have 10 core laboratories that provide core lab services. And um, the thing that I'm going to be talking to you about today, we have these biorepositories, which are really important for pushing forward research on lupus and other autoimmune diseases. And we also um, collaborate heavily with the physicians at Virginia Mason. As you'll see, that's how we um, identify a lot of our patients that participate in or choose to participate in our biorepositories. And we actually have an active clinical research program here at VN. So um, our work is, as I just said, clinical trials, but also um, uh, a big focus of our work is lab-based discovery. And um, we do what is called translational research, which is very human-oriented. We work with samples from 
um, actual people. <laughs> and that's really important to see what's really going on in human cells as opposed to mice, mouse models. We do, have, we do have people who use mouse models, but we, uh, a big portion of our work is a focus on human. And um, another uh, focus of our work is to identify markers that help us to understand who's going to develop autoimmune disease and, and to try and identify it at its earliest stages so we can um, have interventions early before the disease actually takes place, as well as trying to understand, stratify patients and understand who is going to benefit most from a particular therapy. You know, if someone um, doesn't have, uh, I'm sure you're all aware that autoimmune disease is really heterogeneous, and um, so even amongst lupus patients, the um, signs and symptoms can be really different. And so someone may benefit from a certain therapy, um, whereas someone else may not. And, and trying to um, come up with markers to help us understand who is going to benefit from particular therapies is really important as well. So um, what is translational research? I just mentioned that um, we have a big focus on that at BRI. So translational research is primarily using human samples to um, understand disease processes. So I've just shown it in this cartoon here where we, we, um, we deal primarily with blood samples and I'll be telling you quite a bit more about this as I explain our bio, uh, bio repositories. We then take these blood samples, um, do lab research on them, and the goal is to um, identify new markers for the disease and therapies. So um, one of the things that sets Benamory Research Institute apart is that we have these biorepositories. And um, as I mentioned before, we have about 12 of them, and this uh, slide shows you our um, our biggest and mo uh, most important biorepositories. Um, we have uh, primarily disease repositories, but then we also have a healthy control repository because it's really important when we're doing translational research, we need to compare um, experiments using uh, samples from patients to samples from people who do not have the disease so we can understand what is something that is specific for the disease, what is a change that's specific for the disease. So we have uh, a big control registry including um, individuals who have no family histor history of autoimmunity so they're unlikely to carry some of the genetic markers, um, some of the genetic uh, variants that people were referring to earlier that might put people at risk, increased risk for developing autoimmunity. We have a, um, and then as far as disease repositories, of uh, big interest to this group is our rheum rheumatic disease uh, repository, which includes lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, relapsing polychondritis, and scleroderma. And I'll tell you more about our lupus registry in particular. We have a neurologic disease, uh, repository including um, MS and um, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. Uh, we have a um, infectious disease repository which is looking at um, immune responses to various infectious agents including flu and um, the West Nile virus, a pulmonary repository. We have a new um, gastroenterology rep repository that was um, relatively uh, new, started about uh, three years ago, three or four years ago, and we collect Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis patients, and as I mentioned, a new celiac repository. One of our biggest repositories is type 1 diabetes, and um, as part of that, we also have a smaller group of type 2 diabetes that we use as controls in some of our studies. And then the allergy and asthma repository, including um, subjects with peanut and tree allergies, grass allergies, and um, shrimp and milk allergies. And um, uh, the function of our translational research program and the development of our biorepositories is really um, an interwoven and um, 
uh, wheels in a cog type of uh, relationship with Virginia Mason Medical Center. So as I mentioned, a lot of our patients, uh, most of our patients in our Bauer repositories are identified through um, seeing a physician in rheumatology, for example. And um, we have uh, our clinical coordinators who I've shown here in yellow that are a really important key. They're the they're the person who interacts with the physician and with um, the patient to ask them if they would be interested in joining a biorepository. If they are, they um, ask, they give them informed consent, and then they would draw blood samples. So they're a really key piece of this machinery. And then, um, so and here's your clinician, your um, uh, physician on this side. And then um, the samples are sent over to us at Benaroya, where we, um, they go to the core lab and are processed and banked, and then eventually distributed to BRI scientists, but also scientists outside of BRI to move autoimmune disease research forward in a lot of different institutions. And um, another key part of this that I'll talk about a little bit later is that we also incorporate um, data from patient records and lab values to the samples that are collected so that we can tie in when somebody is having a flare versus when their di disease is quiescent or what therapies they might be taking or what their ANA levels are, because this is all important and it helps us to understand more about um, what is going on? Is a marker only present when somebody's having a flare? Is it, can we detect it before the flare starts? Can we use it to predict when somebody's going to have a flare and prevent the flare from happening? So these, as I mentioned, the clinical coordinators are really the people who um, interact with the volunteers that participate in our biorepositories, and these are our clinical coordinators. So um, uh, over here is Melissa Pita. She um, works with the Rheumatic Disease Registry and recruits our lupus and um, RA patients. Um, Sylvia Paso is, works with our um, uh, MS registry, our neurologic registry, and also allergy registries. Cassidy Benasek is uh, our GI and control registries. And Christine Chan is um, the Infectious Disease Registry Clinical Coordinator. And they're also, um, they do things like uh, look at the who's coming in. Is there a new patient coming in who won't be on therapy that she could approach to ask, would you be interested in participating in our biorepository? Or here's someone who's coming in, is in our biorepository, but is having a flare. So she works very closely with the physician, um, physicians in that department, like the neurology department or the rheumatology department, in identifying people who are either already in our repository or um, maybe interested in joining. So this is kind of how it works. We, um, subjects um, are, participate either by um, clinician referrals or we do community outreach. And um, these are some of the um, community outreach opportunities that we participate in. Um, you, I don't know if you've participated in any of like this um, Seafair triathlons or have a family member, but up until last year, uh, BRI helped to sponsor that. And so um, they would close off Ninth Avenue down there and um, have uh, volunteers who were recruiting people to join our repositories. And you just do like a um, mouth uh, cheek swab and um, fill out a questionnaire. And um, then uh, the uh, those samples are processed by the clinical core. And um, it's very easy and simple process to join the control registry, for example. Um, these are our um, clinicians that we work with uh, in the uh, rheumatology department. It's Dr. Jeff Carlin is the PI of the um, principal investigator of our rheumatology um, biorepository, Dr. Mariko Kita, the neurology, and so on and so forth. 
And when we uh, recruit someone to the um, biorepositories, we not only collect biological specimens, but we collect demographic information such as um, race, ethnicity, age, age of onset, if um, you, know, you have an autoimmune disease, um, and then um, subject contact information. So this gives you an idea of how many people participate in our different biorepositories. And this is um, from, uh, this is uh, relevant a couple of years ago. So um, these numbers are uh, probably not quite uh, up to date as of yesterday sort of a situation. But we have almost 1,000 um, control sub, uh, subjects that participate in research, 300 allergy. Um, uh, over uh, 200 infectious disease, 700 GI, um, 800 neur neurology, and in our uh, rheumatic disease repository, uh, we have over almost uh, 2,000 uh, participants, and in diabetes, 1,000. And the samples that we have um, stored in our uh, biorepositories are include um, DNA, RNA, plasma serum, and the white blood cells from your blood. For some of the repositories, mainly the GI repository, we actually have um, biopsies and resections because when people go in for a colonoscopy, they can actually take out little pieces of tissue. But for the other repositories, we don't have um, samples of that type. And then we also have the ability to get fresh blood draws um, because we have the uh, permission to recontact people who participate in our um, biorepositories. And some of the studies um, that we do require fresh blood samples. So um, a key part of our biorepositories is, as I said, we have these samples, but then we also are able to tie this to um, clinical information in the case of the autoimmune patients so we can um, collect disease-specific information. So in the case of lupus, we'll have um, ANA levels. Um, uh, in type 1 diabetes, we might have a glucose uh, control levels or their um, hemo uh, glycosylated hemoglobin levels, so things of that nature. Um, we'll have metal, uh, medical histories and, um, importantly, what therapies are you currently taking? Because sometimes that can impact, you know, depress your immune system. So we want to know that if we're testing something in the lab, okay, could this be due to a therapy that somebody is taking rather than an actual cause of the disease? and then a personal and family history of autoimmunity. And um, then uh, our, uh, uh, we also have standard data that is collected, including um, uh, genotyping, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this. It's part of our core laboratories where we do um, test for some of the genetic variants that are responsible for um, increased risk for some of the autoimmune diseases that you heard heard of earlier, um, uh, demographic information as well as smoking history. And this is all kept together in a state-of-the-art database so that um, we can ask our clinical coordinators, um, can you pull samples for me from um, subjects who are taking a particular therapy. So if we want to ask a question about the effects of a particular therapy, and so the state-of-the-art database is really important for that. So once, what happens to a sample once it's drawn? So the clinical coordinator meets with uh, a patient or a healthy control and asks them if they want to participate. They agree. They um, sign an informed consent that they're um, agreeing of their own free will to participate in this research, and um, they draw a blood sample. So then what happens? So the sample comes across the street to Benaroya, and it goes to our clinical core lab. And this is, these are um, some of the technicians that work in our clinical core lab. And here they are. They're in a, um, what's called a laminar airflow hood to keep the sample sterile. And they process the blood to isolate the white blood cells. 
and then if a scientist needs to do a sample, uh, an experiment on fresh samples, they might deliver the cells immediately or the whole blood immediately to the scientific researcher. If it's not going to be used at that very moment, it will be um, stored under liquid nitrogen in little vials. Here you can see an example of that over here. And um, the, um, the sample is given an identification for studies. Uh, and so our researchers never know who the samples are from. The sample becomes de-identified. We, we have the information about the disease and everything of that nature, but your privacy um, identification remains um, private. And as I said, we have the capacity, our biorepositories are genotyped for some of the genetic markers for autoimmune disease. So um, you may have heard that um, HLA or human leukocyte antigens are really important in autoimmunity. Um, a lot of autoimmune diseases, the biggest genetic risk factor is having a particular um, HLA genotype. We also genotype for some of the other autoimmune variants that have been identified in the last 10 years. And then uh, a lot of our uh, research at BRI is very uh, focused towards what is the contribution of these genetic factors, how are they impacting the immune system to make it um, function in a way that it starts attacking your own body. Um, so uh, this is Ami Charmley. She's the head of the, um, the genotyping core, and um, she tests uh, the samples for their um, genotype using um, some very impressive machinery like this robotic sampler over here. So let's uh, talk a little bit about the Rheumatic Disease Registry. It's headed up by Jeff Carlin, and um, Jane Buckner is the co-principal investigator. And as I said earlier, Melissa Pita is the um, clinical coordinator who interacts with all the um, patients and participants. So our um, Rheumatic Disease Registry, as you saw, is, is really large. It's one of our largest registries. It consists of lupus, uh, and the lupus registry was actually funded by the um, Washington State Life Science Discovery Fund, um, which is the money from the, um, the cigarette settlement, tobacco settlement, um, that Christine Gregoire uh, uh, fought for. And um, so a grant from the LSDF was what we used to begin our lupus registry. We also have a relapsing polychondritis, scleroderma, and rheumatoid arthritis. And um, amongst the rheumatoid arthritis, we also have first degree relatives of uh, family members who have rheumatoid arthritis. So this gives you an idea of like how many samples we have in our uh, banked in our repository as of um, uh, a year ago in April. And um, so this is the total number of uh, subjects, sorry, that we have in the different repositories. So here you can see in lupus we have um, uh, 200 as of a year ago, but I can tell you that um, recently I looked and we were up to over 300 subjects uh, participating in our lupus registry. And um, uh, our biggest uh, group, however, is the uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and then as I mentioned, we have the first degree relatives of RA patients as well. So this is what we're looking at for our current recruitment efforts. Um, the uh, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus are big focuses due to um, interest in these research areas at BRI and within our uh, collaborators. Um, we're looking for um, subjects who have active disease and um, also subjects who might be newly diagnosed before they go on any therapy because then we can see what the immune system is doing before it's impacted by any kind of um, drugs. Um, we find that uh, relapsing polychondritis patients actually find us through our um, online Facebook page or the BRI website 
And then we also get um, clinician referrals and um, from the rheumatology clinic. Most of our participants in our uh, biorepositories are patients at Virginia Mason, but they don't have to be. You can um, come in for um, uh, a blood draw if you uh, like to participate um, through our uh, clinical research unit. This is some of the clinical information that's collected on our uh, rheumatoid, uh, or sorry, our rheumatic disease registry subjects. So sleet eye scores, um, lupus physician assessment, rapid three scores, whatever medications you may be taking, um, uh, date of diagnosis, family history. And then these are some of the lab values that we um, keep in our database as well. So as I mentioned, the, the different um, autoantibodies that are associated with lupus for RA, there's um, rheumatoid factor and, and autoantibody called um, citrulline. Well, it's not really an autoantibody, but uh, citrulline um, antibodies. And then um, inflammation, so uh, CRP levels, for example. So what do we do with the samples? Um, as I said, we have a big focus on autoimmunity at BRI, but we also have a lot of collaborators. So these are some um, uh, pictures of people, uh, researchers at BRI. Um, here's someone working at a flow cytometer, looking through a microscope, working on an assay in the uh, laminar flow hood. And then these are some of the specific projects that are, have been, are funded or have been funded at BRI. So looking at um, a genetic variant in the uh, phosphatase gene that actually is associated with many different autoimmune diseases. You heard earlier about um, genetic uh, variants and some of you asked about um, people who have multiple autoimmune diseases. This is an example of one of those genes that contributes to multiple autoimmune diseases. Um, uh, myself, one of my research projects is looking at a gene that's been associated with risk for lupus, this BANK1 gene, and how it's affecting B cell development and the development of autoantibodies in lupus. And also, uh, more recently, on a, a factor that makes B cells grow. And then lastly, we have a large number of collaborative research agreements with um, pharmaceutical companies. And um, our samples have been incredibly important for um, the biopharmaceutical companies to have access to human samples to test um, for different features of autoimmune disease, but also to test their therapies with in culture systems before they actually try and take them to clinical trials where they're actually injecting them into people. And so um, we have been highly sought out by the biopharmaceutical industry as a source of really well-characterized um, patient samples because this is really, um, there's a big need for, for that um, in the biopharmaceutical industry. So just to close, um, we at BRI feel that um, you know, autoimmune disease is clearly our focus, but we're really in this with all the patients that you know, we can't do this without you, and um, hopefully we're doing something that is giving back to you as well. And um, I just want to mention, uh, Melissa I spoke about earlier as our um, rheumatic disease registry clinical coordinator. Gina Marcazzini is the um, manager for our translational research program, all the different repositories. And we have a web page if you're interested. And then I brought a couple of things that um, with me. So you may have received this or picked it up out there. This is just a summary of our biorepositories if you want to le learn more. This is just a handout about BRI and, and what we do there. And then importantly, if you want to receive more information about what we're doing at BRI with our um, different uh, autoimmune repositories, you can sign up for our newsletter. And if you actually feel like you'd like to participate, you can express an interest to do so on the back of the card. And I left a ginormous yellow envelope <laughs> out there on next to where these are on the 
um, sideboard. And if you um, want to participate or receive the newsletter, feel free to drop the card in there. So um, I'll end there. And I'm happy to take any questions. And again, thank you so much for inviting me to come speak with you today. Um, so the question is, if we do um, tests within BRI, do we return the test results back to the patients? And the answer is no, because they are not uh, produced in a um, CLIA-approved laboratory. <laughs> so um, to any kind of a medical test result that's returned to a patient in any type of laboratory, it has to be in a very approved, um, uh, validated laboratory. And so these are really research results. And um, so because they aren't from a validated assay, we don't return them to subjects. OK, thank you very much. Oh, sure. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I didn't see that. I participated in a Center Research Science Friday, um, which they offer for the and it was fascinating. So we actually, and it's open to the public, to um, go and hear some of your researchers speak about auto and then to take tours of the lab as well. So I encourage everyone, if you're interested, to really learn about auto to um, contact the URI. Yeah, please do that. I think we have the Science Fridays uh, once a month or uh, every two months or so. And if you. And um, Rachel Martin said that she's going to do one on Lubus. So oh, okay. Great. Okay, sounds good. And I'm sorry, you had a question. Yes. Um, you mentioned the um, history relative to the arthritis patients. Mm hmm. I would be very interested in that. Um, I uh, was really intrigued to see, uh, oh, I'm sorry. So the question is, um, uh, she noticed that we had the first degree relatives of RA patients and wondering if we would uh, develop a repository for um, first degree relatives of lupus patients. It's an excellent idea. And um, I can tell you that Dr. Peter Gregerson and Betty Diamond at the Feinstein Institute in New York have a cohort of sisters of lupus, which I was really impressed <laughs> to hear your name here. And those samples are really important because they tell us about changes that may be happening um, prior to disease initiation or samples, uh, changes that might be happening um, that may put you at greater risk for developing lupus. So those samples are really important. And um, I think I would really like to see us move into uh, developing a um, similar first degree relative Sisters of Lupus cohort at um, BRI as well. Um, so the question is, can a first degree relative of a lupus patient be a control patient? Yes, you can be a general control. Um, you would not be a screened control. Those are people who have no family history of autoimmunity, but you can participate as a control as what we call a general control. And they would know in your accompanying information that you have a family member who has lupus. And then if we move into having a lupus registry, then um, you can move into that, <laughs> the uh, Sisters of Lupus registry. Okay. Yeah? You have to have just one autoimmune disease to participate? No, you may have multiple autoimmune diseases, and that's all kept in the demographic information as well. Yes. OK, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Karen, and we certainly appreciate the partnership with BRI. 
Um, hopefully you're all awake and still energized. We have one more presenter and I have the privilege of introducing her. Um, first, I want to make sure everyone has um, her handouts. So you should have four handouts here. Um, one is a self-care plan. And then there's um, actually one that has why is exercise important. And then on the back is the benefits of massage. There's also one that says um, top 10 benefits of drinking water. And on the back side of that is the importance of sleep. I definitely need to hear this. And the last one is a health assessment. So does everyone have all four of those? Nope. Just raise your hand and we'll, we'll get some more out to you. So I'm going to have Ms. Sanithia Parker come up. She has a fancy bio inside the program. You can feel free to read that. But I wanted to introduce her on a, a personal note. She is a member of my church. She is a leader of our health ministry at our church. And she's doing a phenomenal job um, making sure that we stay healthy. Um, our culture loves fried chicken in particular. <laughs> so she is breaking us away of those cultures and providing um, some good nutritious meals for us. So I'm happy to have Sneetha here with us today. I'd like to use the stool, but I'm, I'm kind of clumsy. I might not look like it, but I am. So thank you for having me. Um, it may seem a little unfitting because I'm kind of changing up the whole talk on uh, research, but uh, the, the topic is uh, of what I'm speaking to is you are as unique as your fingerprint. And um, how many of you at this point have discovered that as uh, individuals battling lupus or any other kind of chronic disease that you are as unique as your fingerprints? Show of hands, have you discovered that about yourself yet? Yes, yeah, so um, your experience with lupus is just that, it's, it's your own. And so that even though there's this broad range of symptoms that many of you share in common in varying degrees, uh, you, you, uh, which is a, a great uh, common denominator, uh, having a uh, support group or sharing uh, symptoms in itself is a way of coping and managing and battling against disease, uh, but it is, um, also important that you do the individual work, which many of you I know are doing, is of, of learning and understanding yourselves so that you can uh, find tools to manage uh, dealing with lupus. And so that's where, where I come in. It's just hopefully in the time that I've been speaking with you that I might um, share some information. Maybe you've possibly heard some of these things before and hearing them again, it may resonate with you to uh, try some alternative therapies. Um, most definitely it's not a, a knock at traditional medicine or anything like that. It's just kind of, just kind of opening up our toolkits and our toolbox to add um, modalities that might um, deal with things as, such as pain or taking a look at how um, overall in general our self-care is, how, how well are we caring for ourselves and, and, and dealing with, um, with lupus. So um, that speaks a little bit to my, um, my philosophy. So I do have a heavy medical background. I, I have landed to where I'm in, in uh, the field of massage and kind of non-traditional modalities, but uh, my background is a, a University of Washington graduate. I was um, pre-med and uh, for different reasons uh, set out into a different course, which has been a wonderful experience with me and just learning and dealing with individuals and our unique responses to to uh, the healthcare industry, to traditional and non-traditional therapy. So again, um, hopefully I'll share some information that might be helpful that you can take some tools away today that you can apply. So the, the, the three components of managing lupus that I'm speaking to are nutrition, exercise, and stress management. And so in general, for battling uh, lupus, and of course, again, there's a broad range, but from you know, from my perspective and from the research that I've done, when people have looked into doing alternative therapies, these are some of the things in general that um, in common many people are battling is reducing inflammation in the body and other symptoms of lupus such as skin, uh, the skin reactions, uh, depression, fat fatigue, of course the list goes on. Maintaining strong bones and muscle, many people are on um, uh, uh, steroids and steroids have an adverse affection, leaching, leaching calcium from the bones. 
combating the side effects of medication. Of course, there's which has always been, already been spoken to, which are the steroids and chemo, which are largely used to help when battling flare-ups of, of lupus. Um, again, uh, achieving a, and maintaining a, a healthy weight, some people uh, with the onset of lupus or with the medications may have experienced either an unhealthy weight gain or, or a loss. And then reducing the risk of heart disease uh, which, which is another a big factor um, not to uh, discount any of the other uh, factors such as deal dealing with the inflammation around the lungs or whatnot. So in diving to, into nutrition, a lot of times I find when I'm speaking to people on nutrition that we make these associations and we can't disassociate nutrition with it sim or diet being about uh, a weight or weight management. And we're not, when we speak to diet, we're not talking about weight or weight management. We're just talking about feeding the body nutrient-rich substance. So just fundamental uh, substance for the body, um, for the cells that are needed for optimal health and healing. And in general, the, the average diet, you know, we don't have a lot of variety and we don't have uh, very rich nutrients in our, uh, the, the substances that we put into our body for many of us. And of course, you know, this just speaks to a general population. And it is important, so I, when I'm dealing with uh, patients and coaching them, it's just taking the time to just do the work of considering uh, the foods you're putting into your body. Are you just feeding your hunger or your gut? Are you providing yourself with the nutrients that you need for your body to do what it does best, which is healing, healing itself? So there are many benefits of uh, paying attention to what we're putting into our bodies. Uh, the, having a, a well-balanced diet or great nutrition can induce your can increase energy and relieve fatigue. It's a great tool for managing weight, flushes out toxins, improves our skin complexion, manages regularity, boosts immune, our immune system, uh, puts you in a good mood, and then uh, uh, again, nutrition is another great tool for combating and preventing um, disease, chronic disease, and in general, um, just improves our quality of life and longevity. So I'm often asked um, by many that I work with, like, you know, how do we get started? And I say, take an honest approach of where you are, an assessment as far as uh, your eating. It can be really helpful to keep a food journal. Sometimes it's um, not necessarily what you're eating. It's, it's uh, when you're eating, how much you're eating. Uh, um, sometimes people drink their calories and not really taking much food in. Um, and then if you're keeping a food journal, just to kind of give yourself a look at, you know, how am I taking care of myself? What am I putting into my body? Um, look at the time of day that you eat. You want to, you want to track that. You want to also track your, uh, your uh, write down how you feel after you eat. That can give you a good information about the macronutrients that you put in your body. Maybe there was too much protein or uh, a little too much sugar in it. So those kind of informations, um, um, information help. And then also you want to aim for balance. I, I, I say most times you'll hear eat from all five food groups, but I'm kind of, I'm not a big dairy promoter, so I um, tend to say, you know, you want your protein, you want fruit and vegetable and whole grains. And then, you know, a variety. Be willing to try new things, new foods, kind of expand. A variety is really important. We, our bodies often get bombarded by a lot of the same foods, and then you find at the food industry, they find something cheap like soy or uh, wheat or corn and it's in everything and I was just sharing with a friend how I see kale all of a sudden now it's like kale is the new the food fad <laughs> it's like kale is in everything I've been drinking I well I don't drink them as much because they tend to have a lot of sugar but you know the odd wallets and naked it's like now there was kale it used to just be uh, spirulina it wasn't kale but you know I kind of I laugh at that because I say wow you know here we go again <laughs> and you know and and, it's, and, it, and it can happen I've seen people develop um, food intolerance to something as simple as tomatoes because they just ate them all the time in our bodies, you know, after a while, you know, it, that's why a variety is important. It doesn't, it starts to recognize it as something harmful uh, to the body. So uh, when dealing with lupus, there are some pretty important foods to avoid. Um, gluten is, a, is, a, is really important. Of course, sodium, and sodium speaks to kind of the heart conditions and inflammation. Grapefruit, licorice, sugar, MSG, echinacea, golden seal, ginkgoba, biloba, ginseng, astragus, uh, clover, alfalfa, soy, and onions. And the important thing about those, uh, those four there, the clover, the alfalfa, the soy, and onions, is that they have been, um, in some people, they have been um, seen to cause lupus 
flares. So they contain uh, an amino acid called L-calvinine, and um, so those are why those are listed there. So there are also some foods to limit, and see there's foods that we may eat and we might not realize that how they're affecting their, our body, but they also, and paying attention to um, the ingredients and, and reading ingredients and knowing what you're putting to your body because, again, when I was speaking to the food industry, there's some things that are, that are cheap, and so they tend to be in a lot of things that you wouldn't even uh, think of. You know, I've done some elimination uh, diets where I just gave up things and I'll go to try to avoid uh, soy and then it's, it's in everything so you, you really have to really watch for you're putting in your body and then speaking to um, hormones and information that Dr. Uh, Grant was giving earlier, um, soy also acts like estrogen in the body. So soy is a really important thing to avoid, especially dealing with lupus and hearing some of the information shared with estrogen and, and how um, uh, there's a higher incidence of estrogen and how it affects and kind of looking at the hormonal component. Uh, so that's a, these are um, wonderful reasons of why we might consider um, our nutrition and what we're putting into our body. So some foods um, to limit, and the other foods, of, of course, those were foods that are good to avoid for um, inflammation and, and flares. But peas, beans, lentils, peanuts, caffeine, red meat, excessive amounts of protein, dairy, uh, mushrooms, and night, nightshade vegetables such as tomatoes, white potatoes, eggplant, sweet, and hot peppers. And so just learning different food groups and how they can affect you is really important. We all have a different tolerance, but again, this is specifically speaking to, uh, to lupus. So there are also wonderful foods to add for, uh, for varying reasons for the, because they're high in omegas or iron or calcium rich. So some um, foods that are high in iron are hemp seed and quinoa. Omega-3s, uh, you have fish, flax, walnut, and hemp oil. Foods rich in calcium, focusing on dark leafy greens as a source of calcium, spinach, chard, green, uh, kale, beet tops, any type of green, the mustard, the turnips, the collards. Uh, coconut water is an excellent source of electrolytes and potassium. Uh, walnuts, and if you have any type of um, intolerance, sometimes with um, digestion, you can soak the walnuts for uh, two hours and that helps with digestion. Uh, tart cherry juice is another one that's been referred to as helping um, with iron deficiencies. And then there are foods in the, uh, that are higher in antioxidants. And I always kind of give, uh, these are our quote unquote superfoods, and I think it's really important when we talk about superfoods that we look at the word super, because sometimes when we're um, looking at it, we see the misnomer of the mystical power of super. The superfoods really aren't super that they do have a curative or do anything special to the body. They're just super because they're higher in antioxidants. And the anti actually, antioxidants are really great because they protect our body from free radicals that damage the cells in the body. So they're really no superhero or super fix, but they're great because they have great um, um, properties such as anti-inflammatory properties, great for iron or energy. And to speak to a few, of course, we've heard of blue, many of us have heard blueberries and pomegranate are high in antioxidants or superfoods. Uh, but specifically for inflammation, there's maki powder, Corellia, and golden berries. For iron, Turkish berries, or excuse me, Turkish mulberries. For energy, goji berry, uh, mac, uh, maki, and acai powder. So then that kind of brings us into like herbs and supplementation and, and going to that, it can be really uh, powerful if you're considering adding anything. So kind of a, this is more of a foundation of like adding tools to your toolbox. I mean, many of you are working with your um, doctors and sometimes, you know, we have these wonderful tools that are already working really well for us to manage uh, dealing with lupus. But sometimes um, what we have in our toolbox isn't quite working all the, as well as we'd like. And sometimes, you know, that's where I hope this piece comes in is this maybe considering adding a tool or two to manage uh, the pain or to deal with infl inflammation or just something to help you be proactive and in, in, in dealing with um, you know, what you're putting in your body, environmental toxins. And so that being said, um, if you, um, a lot of times working with a natural path, um, that can also work with your practitioner, your primary doctor, because when you get into supplementation and vitamins, um, you have to worry about um, you know adverse reactions and making sure that someone's aware of the medications that you're taking and making sure that there's no um, interaction there. 
Um, and there's some wonderful integrative type um, institutes out there. Uh, the Institute of Complementary Medicine, I have um, personally some clients that I work with that have um, serious health conditions and they've, they've found it very powerful to kind of have advocates on both sides. They want to explore non-traditional therapies and dealing with their pain or, or you know, other things going on with their body. So, uh, those are some uh, great avenues, and there's there's more uh, you know uh, resources out there as far as um, kind of an East meets West philosophy. But vitamins that can be very helpful when dealing with lupus are uh, vitamin D, uh, calcium, magnesium, folic acid, B13, B6, and DHEA. And then herbs, um, of course, again working with a professional to make sure that you have access to a high quality pharmaceutical grade and usually they'll come in a tea or capsule form. And so there's some great um, herbs for dealing with inflammation, boswellia, uh, feverfew, devil claw, ashwandaga, and nettle. And if you're dealing with pain, there's uh, pau de arco and uh, just a good general detox for the body is uh, burdock. So another component of dealing, which, which I find, if you look across the board, and uh, my passion is prevention, so I'm often um, dealing with trying to uh, reach populations that are disproportionately affected by chronic disease, and African Americans, Hispanic Native Americans, those are kind of our, the populations that I, um, I speak to. Um, and um, another encouragement I, I wanted to, uh, for um, people of color in the audience, and we're listening to about research, a lot of times we're not a representative of the research that's being done, and uh, we are needed representative. You know, we're disproportionately affected at you know, lupus and uh, many other chronic diseases, breast cancer, and uh, participating in these studies kind of helps give clue into what's going on with our bodies and you know what's the difference, why, are we, why do we have higher incidence. So uh, that's just my encouragement of why it's important to uh, be involved but also participate, be, participate in these research um, that's going on so that we can find a cure. Uh, that being said, um, across the board in prevention or dealing with chronic disease, uh, I found that to be, it's, it is the, uh, the diet, exercise and stress management are the, the key tools into managing and battling chronic disease. Across the board, you tweak it to what, you know, sometimes there's um, vitamins that are better, there's uh, certain uh, supplements that are better, certain foods that cause flares, but across the board, just those, those three things are um, key components in battling. So moving to exercise, a lot of times, you know, um, not feeling good in your body, it's like, well, how do I move, how do I exercise? Um, and I don't get much into that, but uh, speaking on um, the exercise, we'll talk about the types of exercise and why it's important. And it's really important because in our youth, we do have more elasticity and flexibility, but as we get older, we do, we do tor tend towards rigidity and stiffness, so uh, it's a great encouragement of, of why to keep uh, movement. But exercise, again, uh, wonderful benefits, um, um, helping to prevent disease, improves you know, appear appearance, uh, delaying the aging process, improves stamina, posture, uh, strengthening and toning the, the, the body, the muscle, enhancing, flex enhancing flexibility, improving, uh, or a great tool for uh, weight management, and then just, again, overall quality of life. And then um, the different types of exercise. A lot of times we just think exercise is just exercise, but there's, there's uh, four different types. There's endurance, strength, balance, and flexibility, and they all have their different uh, benefits. Of course, the endurance is more of the aerobic um, exercise, getting your heart and your uh, breathing up. Um, is great for the conditioning of the heart, the lungs, and the circulatory system. And exercise, those are exercises such as jogging, uh, brisk walking, running, dancing. And then there's uh, strengthening exercise, which speaks more to our uh, bone and muscle uh, development, uh, bone density and strengthening and muscle development. Those are typically our strength training and resistance training, uh, lifting weights, uh, using your own body weight, using bands um, for exercise. Then there's balance exercise, which is, um, those are, the balance is just great, I think, in general. It kind of seeps into just overall feeling balanced in your body, uh, feeling balanced mentally, uh, balanced in life. Balance is just kind of a key thing, uh, and it speaks to me anyways. Um, and different, it can be simple as, you know, standing on one leg, um, you know, raising up on your toes and slowly lowering down. Those are different things, uh, different exercising and working on balance. Also, tai chi is a great 
exercise for balance. And then there's flexibility exercises, and unlike the kind of the strengthening exercise where we're working on the tonicity of the muscle and the muscle kind of contracting, because muscles only pull, they don't push, they only contract, and oftentimes when we contract and contract or we're using a muscle or doing action over and over again, the muscle can shorten, and it kind of stays in this contracted state. So uh, doing uh, flexibility exercises to kind of uh, lengthen that muscle, but the, the reason why that's also important too, when a muscle gets in a contracted state, it's not getting good blood flow, it's not getting the oxygen and the nutrients it needs. So it's not as healthy of a muscle as it can be as if when it's getting that proper blood flow in and the nutrients that waste in and waste out. So uh, great flexibility exercises, uh, just stretching and yoga, just taking a minute to just doing little stretches, you know, in your day are, are just wonderful uh, ways to in, um, add flexibility exercises to your day. And then the last component, um, just um, how are you managing your stress? So, um, of course, stress is terrible on the body for many reasons. Um, and I was um, in speaking to uh, specifically the production of uh, cortisol, which is a normal hormone in the body that serves a great purpose. But because we live, or it's also called the stress hormone, but because we live in a very high, uh, very fast paced, uh, I think kind of a stressful society that we oftentimes have a lot of this hormone dumped into our body and we don't get a chance to kind of, and we're always in this flight or fight response and, and we don't get a chance to kind of really let down. And when you don't get a chance to let down, you don't get the other um, response of your parathetic parasympathetic nervous system kicking in, allowing to kind of that relax and digest. And um, having um, high um, amounts or prolonged levels of, of this hormone in your body can, can have negative effects such as um, impairing your, um, your ability to perform cognitively, uh, suppress thyroid function, uh, blood sugar imba imbalances, bone density. Um, decreasing your bone density, decreasing muscle tonicity, um, higher blood pressure, um, lowering your uh, immunity, so your abilities, of body, it slows your immune system, your abilities of body to, to do what it does best, which is also an, a, you know, another whammy because of course it's already uh, suppressed due to the autoimmune uh, disease. And then um, increased abdominal fat, so these are uh, some of the negative uh, effects of just having that, being in that fight or response, fight or fight response um, uh, in your body. And so I believe in general, like the stress affects the whole mind, body, and spirit um, complex. And, and um, in the handouts, there's a health assessment in the mind, body, uh, spirit, um, uh, self-care plan. And um, stress is just, you know, that you hear a lot of times it's the number one killer is just because of uh, the effects it has on your body it can decrease your sleep, uh, you know, cause poor eating habits, um, in, uh, de depression, decrease desire to, to be active or to even take care of yourself, um, increase the probability in the onset of developing chronic disease and the list goes on. So it's really important that we take the time to consider our self-care and managing our stress levels. I think um, uh, sometimes we have different roles or many roles, mothers, sisters, uh, you know, you're uh, your, your work, um, sometimes just taking the time to care for yourself can be hard, even for me. You know, I, I tend to think that I have a pretty decent self-care plan and I look at it and I'm like, well, I'm really good at focusing on one area in my self-care. You know, I love to go to the gym and work out, but what do I do as far as, you know, uh, making sure I'm, 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 I'm nourishing all aspects of the whole mind, body, and spirit. And so there's, um, I just came up with a list of different um, activities that you can use, such as exercise, meditation, journaling, prayer, yoga, listening to music, or uh, breathing exercises, and those can fit in different places for different people. Sometimes just for me, exercise can go for my mind because it really does, for me, help me manage um, my stress and how I feel. Um, speaking to breathing exercises um, with uh, breath work, the inhalation is energizing for the body, so uh, and the exhale, exhalation is uh, more relaxing and soothing. So if you want to use those techniques um, for kind of relaxing the body, you want to focus, and sometimes you can do like a three to five ratio. If you're focused on relaxation, you want to focus on the exhale. So the inhale will be shorter, the exhale will be longer, so it would be three on the inhale and then five on the exhale. And just taking a few minutes out your day just to do that, you, it, it's amazing what kind of relaxing effects it has on the body. 
There's also been studies on, on water and how even when, you know, sometimes someone's really upset and you give them, a lot of times people will just offer you water. There's a reason it has a calming effect, a relaxing effect on, on the body. And <laughs> I didn't have much, that's all I have. I know that it's a, it seems a bit off topic and maybe unfitting, but I do hope that it speaks to someone, that there was something maybe um, shared, um, like, wow, I didn't know nightshade, shade, nightshade vegetables had such effect uh, on me, or having a soy was like, um, es work, works like estrogen in the body hormonally. Um, I, I do hope that um, there was a, a one or two tools or takeaways that you can use um, to just uh, for your managing lupus and self-care. And with that being said, are there any questions? <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm <laughs> I feel like I'm hearing crickets, but, you know, often in my experience, you know, I do work with women, and, uh, and, and by large, it's like, where, where do I begin? And, and, I, and I do say, sometimes it can be hard. Sometimes you've got to really take an honest approach of where I am, and that's where the journaling um, is. And then um, also taking baby steps. I think we overwhelm ourselves and try to quit cold turkey and say, I'm just not going to do this. And it can be as simple as, I'm going to drink more water every day, or I'm going to um, increase my fruits and vegetables. You might notice that uh, you have a tendency to go for the grains the most because they're filling and easy and carrying fruits and vegetables more is more difficult. So then just starting by carrying a, a, a fruit and um, a vegetable with you, carrying snacks with you so that you have access to to the foods that you'd like, um, you know, to the, to the healthier options. Because I think we at large are in a society where we don't have access to healthy options. And we, so we have to make sure that we kind of plan and, and carry those. And then it can be, um, because it's overwhelming, and uh, I think it's nice to, to if you can um, either have an accountability partner, someone who kind of is either good at modeling what you'd like to do um, that can encourage you, or finding someone who's just, you know, you know, just kind of say, how did it go today, you know, or uh, I need some ideas. What, what are some changes that I can make? So I, just starting small, making baby steps. Um, yeah. Thank you for asking. Thank you for the question. Oh, yeah. So the question is, um, uh, do I have a perspective on um, how to reach the disproportionate, disproportionate populations? And it's really a difficult question. It's, um, I was led through the health ministry, and it's opened up a whole, um, it's opened up my perspective on, on dealing with it. I, I, I think uh, we are a very challenging population. I think it's overwhelming. Um, I think we're not used to um, uh, advocating for ourselves and for our health. Um, that we um, we have this trusting but not re trusting relationship with our doctors. We go, we listen to what they say. We know that it's valuable, but for some reason, for cultural differences, it not resonating well with us. We we go and we listen, but we don't take it away. We don't do what we're supposed to do. So I think it is building those relationships. I think uh, we're more trusting when it's coming from people of color, unfortunately, for um, age-old reasons, um, and just just the whole trusting factor. Um, I think the group setting is really important. I think working in faith-based organizations has been um, key and, and needs more work needs to be done there. Working with churches and pulling churches or faith-based organizations together. Um, I found uh, so far in my works that working with people of color, a group setting, a group dynamic is um, better and letting someone for the group seek you out individually when they're ready to make the steps of kind of trying these new things. It can just be at large very overwhelming and um, uh, at times very heartbreaking for me because I get in front of audiences all the time and you say, well, if you do these things and it's like the age old, okay, diet, exercise, stress management, uh, you know, nothing new I haven't heard. but 
the self-care component really just is not there the way it should be and, and is very needed. And the information um, is very me needed. Um, I don't know that I'm answering the question, but I, I am giving a few tools and suggestions to say I do think, again, faith-based organizations, pulling them together, um, kind of trying to pull uh, larger groups that way. Um, and even then still, it's, it's a challenge. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, we've had some incredible presenters today, and I'm very, very moved. Um, and I've learned a lot. Um, so it's late. We have five or ten minutes. If anyone has any question that you would like to ask um, about the Lupus Foundation of America, Sisters Against Lupus, this is a great chance, but probably people have been sitting down too long. I do want to say that um, um, James um, Kruger, who has been very generously, thank you, James, um, live streaming for us, has told me that will be up probably around 6 o'clock tonight, is that? Yeah, it may take a, it's a long stream, so it may take about three or four hours. Long stream, three, right. Four hours, but right. it'll definitely be up in the morning. Okay, tomorrow morning. Um, please remember to give us your surveys, okay? It's very important that we hear from you because we'd like to have your input about future programs. Um, and what else can I say about, oh, did you want to do a few interviews before? Yes, if okay. anybody would like to up. The stream will be running after the symposium is over. We'll go ahead and, and take, I, I know we've got at least one interview question, so if anybody else has something that uh, they'd like to get up in front of the camera and say, we'd uh, like to. That would out be there great. on the internet, and it'll be up after this for, you know, probably years. So, <laughs> and a chance to get out there and say something to the world. And your chance to promote lupus awareness. So, thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. We hope we see you again very soon. Okay.
Shakira Stewart and Shakira is 15 or 16 years Test, test. Yeah? Yeah, we got. Okay. Shelly. Thank you. You're hot. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> And your last name again is? Thank you. Let me know when your camera is ready, James. Um, you know, do you want to trade chairs just because, James, if she and I trade chairs, then you've got a straight on angle to Shakira. Would that be better? Pull you guys a little bit more center right over here. Your chair just to the left there a little bit. Like, like this? Good, yeah, that's better. That's okay. Better. Okay, you're in. Is this good? I got you. I got you both in the frame. You're good to go. I'm Shelley Dudley, and my guest today is Shakira Stewart. Hi, Shakira. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, why you're here today? I'm here today because I was diagnosed. Should I be holding this? No, go ahead. I was here. I'm here today because I was diagnosed with lupus when I was 14 years old. It's systemic lupus. What is it? Ery erythematosus. <laughs> and I had symptoms like the malar rash across my cheeks, um, achy joints in my hands, especially muscle soreness, fatigue. I had rapid hair loss. I lost a lot of it. That's why it's short now. And I moved to Washington because there's less UV rays that all make my symptoms less prominent. So these symptoms sound like they're totally unrelated to each other. Was it difficult for the doctors to diagnose you? No, it took about two days for them to actually diagnose me. What happened was all of these I thought were unrelated, so I didn't see the doctor until I couldn't move my hands in the morning. So the doctor put it together pretty quickly, actually. They said, we're just going to test you to make sure some things like lupus or something like that isn't the problem. And it came back the next two days later or so. And they got me right on it and diagnosed. That's excellent. So a good medical team supporting you? Yeah, it was over in El Paso, Texas. So they didn't have many experts up there, but the people did know for whatever reason they knew. And how long ago was that? Well, I'm 16 now, so it was two years ago. It was April of 2012. And so you've been living with lupus for two years or more now that you're aware of. And what has that meant to your life? It's done a lot. It, I think it's brought my family closer, especially because everyone now cares a little bit more about each other and we're all closer now and for me personally it's done a lot with my social skills because a lot of people stop talking to me because of my physical appearance and it's made me a bit happier about myself and more appreciative of not just physically but my emotional and mental cap capacity and I think that's done well plus I think I'm a good donation to the lupus community because I like to put it out there and I like to do school drives and have them put on purple for lupus awareness and everything like that so it sounds like you have a really great support team surrounding you tell me a little bit more about that well my mom is a huge part of everything she's been everything about this she's really really supportive and my grandparents too once they found out, it's been the huge deal of the family. Everyone knows what it is. Everyone has to do everything. It's very close. So maybe while we wouldn't wish lupus upon anybody, in your case, it's brought the family closer together, and that may not be a bad thing. Yeah, I think overall it was kind of a blessing. I might be saying that because I'm not red in the face right now, but I think overall it was a good thing, especially for lupus itself and those who are less fortunate about it, at least with people like me who aren't as badly affected, I can help spread awareness and help them find a cure too. 
So for those who want to learn more about lupus or who know nothing about lupus, what would you say? Say lupus is an autoimmune disorder where your immune system is attacking healthy tissues instead of bad tissues. That's about it. It affects everywhere. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, man. You are a star. Thank you for joining us. Do you want to say anything like hi, mom? <laughs> <laughs> She's right there, but hi. Oh, <laughs> she watch it again. Okay, so now we so have. All the boys back home. Lupus <laughs> 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 All right, well, nice job. And now we have. Shelia Gomillion. Shelia Gomillion? Gomillion. Gomillion? Okay, and we've got her next. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Take care. Now, did you say Shelia? Shelia. What a beautiful name. I'm Shelly Dudley, and today we're here with Shelia Gomelian. Shelia, tell us a little bit about why you're here today. I am here today in support of LFA and to um, see what's new out there um, as far as the doctors and the scientists and the things that they're coming up with. Now for those who have no idea what LFA stands for, can you give us a bit of a clue? It is the Lupus Foundation of America and today this is presented by the Pacific Northwest Chapter. Um, I've been a part of the chapter now for I believe about 10 years. so. That's quite a long time. What drew you to becoming involved with the Lupus Foundation of America? Um, just finding out that I, once, once I was diagnosed with lupus, i um, wanting to be an advocate. And so I'm blessed to say that each year I've gotten stronger as, as far as advocacy goes. And um, so I'm still striving to be a better advocate for myself and for other lupus patients. So what does being an advocate for the Lupus Foundation mean to you? What it means to me is that um, I talk about lupus no matter where I go, whether I'm in the grocery store or at the gas pump. Um, I'm always asking, have you heard about lupus? Um, and as far as within my community, um, just getting out there and spreading the word to the people of color, because I live in a very diverse small town, um, not small town, but um, an area where the outreach could be a, a lot stronger and the awareness could improve greatly. And why is this important to you? What what does it mean to you? Why 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 make people aware of this? Um I want people to be aware because I want the next generation um, to be able to have a diagnosis or to be able to possibly be cured. Um, it's it's fighting for for my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren um, to make sure that they are aware and that they can um, lead the fight. So now tell me a little bit about the people that support you. A person with lupus doesn't necessarily have an easy life and a support network is quite important. Tell me a little bit about your support network. Um, my support network is awesome. Um, I have uh, initially would not say anything to my family or friends um, about it um, and I worked in the healthcare field so that was just something that I didn't choose to do but having told my children about it and my family about it um, like I said each day um, they grow more knowledgeable and they ask more questions um, my healthcare team is awesome from my primary care to my rheumatologist so works out well and what does this mean to you, having this support network in place? Um, having seen people without the support network, um, I've seen people um, actually be sicker um, because they, they don't have anybody to help them out. Um, so for me, having, having my sons and my siblings um, there to lift me up physically or spiritually is, is just a blessing. So if you could reach out to someone out there who's struggling on their own with the symptoms of lupus 
and they've not put that support network in place, what message would you give to them? Um, I would say reach out because there there are other people within the community like yourself that have lupus or an autoimmune disorder that they're there for you and you just have to speak up. If if you don't speak up for yourself, nobody knows what you're going through. Nobody knows that you need help. So you have to say what you need in order to receive. What an excellent way to put it. Thank you, Sheila Go Gomelian. What a beautiful name. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. Awesome. Up. Hi, how are you? How are you? Great, thank you. And your name is? Shannon. Nice to meet you, Shannon. Nice your last to meet name you, is? too. Stamper. Hi. Hi. Let me sort myself out here, sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Shelly Dudley, and I'm here today with, did you say Sheila? Shannon. Shannon. I am so <laughs> sorry. I just got done interviewing Sheila, and it's, her name is on my brain now because it's a bit unusual. I'm Shelly Dudley, and I'm here today with Shannon Stamper. That's a tongue twister. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon, tell us a little bit about why you're here today. Well, um, I'm here because um, about in 2009 I was diagnosed with lupus. And um, when I was 13 months, I had the chicken pox. And the chicken pox got into my spinal fluid and gave me encephalitis. Which is an infection in the brain, and it made me lose all my speech. <laughs> I couldn't talk from 13 months to about two or three. So I learned American Sign Language. Wow. And the doctors who, and from the encephalitis, I started to have seizures. I am currently nine years seizure free. <laughs> That is a blessing. That's amazing. <laughs> yes, it is. And um, the doctors who diagnosed me at 13 months told my family and friends that I had a 20% chance of surviving. <laughs> so you have defied the odds and then some. <laughs> yes, I have. Wow. Yes. Wow. Yes. So you have not had an easy life at all. Mm, nope, not at all. <laughs> And so how is it that you're sitting here today with a big smile on your face, <laughs> giving to others? How, how are you able to do that? I don't know. <laughs> now, um, I know that many people with lupus don't live an easy life, and they have a strong support network that they put in place, and that helps keep them going and makes their life a bit easier. Is that the same case with you? Yes. I have, I have a huge support system. My family, my friends... Um, my coworkers, I work at a grocery store, and my coworkers are amazing. I love my store manager. <laughs> I love my coworkers, you know, they're amazing. So now tell me a little bit about these people that comprise your support network and what they mean to you and, and what they're able to, to do for you and, and how that changes the quality of your life, if, if it does at all. My, uh, my parents have been there for me throughout my whole entire life, including my mom. My mom is the best. I mean, <laughs> she, is, I mean she gives me my shots. You know, she's amazing. And... <laughs> It sounds like. Yeah. It sounds like she is an amazing. Yes, actress. she is. <laughs> and anyone else in your support network that, that is especially important to you? Um, my boyfriend. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about him. He's um. His mom passed away. Of his mom passed away with MS a couple years ago, and so he knows. And so he understands, you know, that I have lupus and, you know, he knows that I'm tired all the time. And <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like he's also a very patient person as well yes, as very he helpful. Is. Yes, he is. That's good. Yes. So now, how long have you been involved with the Lupus Foundation of America Pacific Northwest Chapter? About... I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a little while then, yeah. not just yeah. yesterday. No. <laughs> and why did you get involved with them? Because um, I got involved with them because 
I have lupus mm -hmm. and I wanted to learn more about the disease. And <laughs> so now would you say that if there's someone out there who has maybe some odd symptoms that they can't explain and they sort of fit in this category or this, or this um, uh, set of symptoms that are unique to lupus, would it behoove them to go to the website, maybe give the foundation a call? What would you have to say to someone like that? I would have to say give them a call or go to their website. And uh, what can the Lupus Foundation do for them? What, what does it offer? It offers them support. Okay. And we've already talked about how important that <laughs> is in a person's life. Yes, we have. <laughs> Very good. So in closing then, what would you say to someone out there who thinks they might possibly have lupus? Um, just surround yourself with people, you know. Yeah. Obviously, it makes a Obviously, difference. Obviously, yes, it does. Well, Shannon, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure getting to know you, and I am amazed and inspired <laughs> by your drive and your beautiful smile. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Jackson and blur my face. <laughs> <laughs> I promise not to bite. You look way better than Michael Jackson. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and your last name is Tyrell. Thank you. I'm Shelly Dudley and I'm here this afternoon with Neela Tyrell. And Neela, tell us why you're here today. Well, I work here. <laughs> okay, great. So I um, I am a part-time staff for the Lupus Foundation of America but I've also had lupus since I was five and oh and the past two weeks I was recovering a really bad flare so I've had a flare for about six weeks and now I have a cold <laughs> so poor thing now for those who aren't necessarily familiar lupus attacks the autoimmune system is that correct yes we call it um, it's like a uninvited guest in your home <laughs> you know they come they tear up your home and you know you want to keep them there but then you want to get rid of them you just don't know how so that's kind of a way we describe it so then if your immune system has been compromised this is how you became ill over the last couple of weeks is that right? yes yeah. definitely well it's nice to see you feeling a little bit better and being up and about and joining us today so now if you work part-time for the foundation you must very much believe in what the foundation does tell us a little bit about the foundation and how it can help someone so our mission is to help people affected with lupus and my area is I'm the one who answers the phone I talk to you I do all of our data entry and to me honestly it's a burden and a gift to be in this foundation I mean I go home and I'm like worried I'm like talking to people who were recently diagnosed and then I was like I was there you know and I'm crying with them I was there you know and I want to help people with lupus because we're not alone you know and I grew up thinking that I was alone in this fight you know my parents didn't know what it was my family they just thought I was lazy or, you know, mm -hmm. just one of the slacking children. And I'm seeing so many more people with lupus, and I'm like, man, I don't feel bad for myself anymore. Now I'm changing my view of lupus, and I want to find a cure. You know, I want to inspire people. I want to educate people, spread awareness, because you never know, you know. Uh, and I'm hoping that more Islanders would come out, because <laughs> I've only met two. And I'm like, where, where are these people? You know, who has lupus? Don't, every symptom matters. I can have a headache and it'll turn into an inflammation of the brain. Mm. Lupus is something we need to take seriously. So you alluded to your own story a little bit and how difficult it was to become diagnosed where the symptoms were not immediately all put together and, and understood to be the cause of lupus or symptoms of lupus at least. Tell us a little bit about that. Is that a common thing? Um, I hear that it's an average 4 to 12 
years before someone is diagnosed. So it's a combination of ANA testing, double-stranded testing, and clinical testing. And for me, I started losing my hair at five, and they thought it was the shampoo I was using or I'm out in the sun. And then when I was six and seven, I started having joint pains. I was tired. I wasn't actually diagnosed until 12. So quite a long time. it is a long time, but they had to do several testing and monitor every time I went in. And I feel like lupus does get misdiagnosed, and it's, a, it's important to do the right steps on how to diagnose it. So I'm glad they diagnosed it eventually. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So then once you were diagnosed with lupus, did that make a difference in the quality of your life? It depends, because when I was diagnosed, they gave me one little pamphlet. They said, you have lupus, here you go. And they, they didn't refer me to other, you know, sites like LFA or the cells or the Lupus Alliance Research. I didn't know any of those until I joined LFA. I'm like, I haven't learned any of this about lupus. So it's one of the things is when people are diagnosed, it's really important that their doctors informing them on the different resources that they can they can get and I feel like that's what we need we need resources we need more awareness not not many doctors know what lupus is anyway so so this explains why you're so uh, such a strong advocate for the lupus foundation of America northwest chapter because uh, I can see your passion about bringing this education to the public and to the medical community Yes, it, it's hard. I mean, people still give me that blank face, like, what's lupus? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, I don't really know how to explain it to you, but it's a non-contagious AIDS is all I can tell you. And it is, it, uh, you're right, that people don't know what it's about, I think, makes it a little more difficult. But, you know, I can see your passion in bringing that education to them and letting them know that lupus is a disease that uh, we need to find a cure for. Definitely, and he was just telling me, James was just telling me, I don't look sick, which is true. Mm -hmm. Things about lupus is you could be, you could look as healthy as um, an athlete, yes. and you're fighting a battle inside, and I feel like that's what we need right now, is we need to let people know that, yeah, we'll have bad days. Yeah, I'm going to cancel this with you because I'm just not feeling well. I'll be fine right now, and then in the next half hour, I could have a flare. Mm -hmm. So that's why lupus is very unpredictable, and it's scary sometimes. So now, if there were someone out there who were watching this right now, and they thought they maybe have some symptoms of lupus, what would you uh, say to that person? It's hard to say anything because, mm, you know, getting the right medicine and treatment and everything, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. So depending on your insurance, <laughs> go get checked. <laughs> but I, I don't know. I have um, health insurance through my mom, so I'm not paying as much. But then there are others who, don't, who have to pay a lot. And having, you know, the renal lupus, I, I would be looking at 60000 a year. Mm -hmm. But with the health insurance with my mom, I'm lucky because I don't spend that much. So I don't really know what to say. I feel like if we had more awareness and the government was more involved, then it'd be easier for us to get tested and treat treatments, proper treatments. So I don't really know an answer to that. Okay, so your first advice then obviously is to go get checked. And then uh, what about maybe getting in touch with the Lupus Foundation? Uh, is there any kind of support network out there for somebody who might be on their own and thinking maybe they've got some symptoms or? Um, so LFA, we do have the thing called Lupus Line. You just call the closest chapter, so you can just look it up. Ours is in Renton, and we go, we handle Oregon and Washington, so people call and we find, we help them find the resources they need from new doctors to health care to disability, and it's important because I didn't know any of those, and once I'm 26, I won't have my mom, so it's, it's a good thing to plan ahead. Some people are lucked out because they have nothing, and it's hard to find a job with lupus. You know, you never know when you're going to have a flare and get laid off because of it, so. You would have to have a very supportive and understanding company that you work with and, and the people there. Yeah, 
and it's hard to find. So I don't know. Some people work at Boeing and they are fine, and then eventually lupus will catch up, and that's it. You know, so you just really gotta watch what what you do with your life and don't take life for granted. I think that's excellent advice. Don't take life for granted. Well, Neela, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Have a great afternoon. You too. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> can you delete all that? <laughs> no. <laughs> no I mean, we can. But there's now. no reason to. <laughs> Thank you. We have the chair of Alex The chair of pain. Oh, what a pleasure. I am Shelley Dudley, and I am here with a good friend of mine, Lori Campbell. And I had the pleasure of meeting Lori by happy accident one day <laughs> when she came to do a radio show that I was involved with. Lori, it is great to see you again. Well, thank you, Shelley. It is wonderful to see you as well. Now, what I know uh, may not be what somebody watching this knows, so tell us a little bit about your story, Lori, because um, I had the pleasure of hearing this before, mm -hmm. but uh, you, you are such a healthy-looking and vibrant-looking, beautiful woman that I think that you have um, a hidden secret that not everybody knows. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, Shelley, you are correct. I do have a, if you want to call it that, a hidden secret. And one of the things is, is that I do have systemic bullous, what they call bullous lupus, um, converging into a couple of different other types of lupus, which is also lupus nephritis. And it's complicated by a lot of orthopedic situations. So... So now what we've learned at the symposium today is that lupus is an autoimmune disease. It attacks your immune system and makes you very susceptible to uh, everything that happens to come along the pike, every little virus, and, and also uh, it attacks your, your own uh, body. Mm -hmm. So now how is it that you can look so healthy and vibrant and beautiful and, and gorgeous and energetic when y this is happening inside you? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, basically, you and you definitely are too kind <laughs> with the compliments. <laughs> but one of the things is, is that we talked about today with um, many of the speakers where they talked about having self-interest and how you want to be able to live with this disease. And one of the things that's really important in living with this disease is understanding what your body can take and how you need to manage your daily activities, how you need to manage your um, as far as your eating habits and different things that truly affect this disease. So I know that on the outside, you know, I may look like this vibrant uh, person who's living a very healthy lifestyle, but it definitely has been a challenge over the years to be able to do that. So. So it sounds like you've become a good steward of your resources. You know how much energy you have. You know the foods and the activities that will build energy and take energy from you. And so you're very good about managing those types of things. Is that what you would say? Yes, definitely. And I want to say that it has taken me many years in order to be able to understand, you know, what my energy level is, what are the different things that I need to do in order to make sure that I'm living the quality of life that I want to live. So it doesn't come overnight. You know, I've had lupus for about 18 years. And I would say probably for about the first 10 to around 12 years, it was extremely difficult because you're taking a lot of medications that may cause weight gain. You're taking medications that causes fatigue, sleepless nights, and have so many side effects that it's really difficult just in dealing with the disease itself, but also trying to manage your daily schedule, your daily life with all of these side effects that you have. So it, it took me about 10 to 12 years to kind of figure out what is it that I need to do for me in my specific situation to be able to manage this in a way that I'm still having a quality of life that I want to have. These are really, really important things that you're sharing with people out here to, mm -hmm. to get to know about 
living with this disease and having a great quality of life as well. How important would you say having a support network is? A uh, support network is is just indescribable as far as um, how important it is. Um, one of the things with lupus is that people tend to do is they tend to um, close off themselves. And they do that because as anyone else who may be suffering from any type of disease or just even when you're sick, you don't want to feel as if you're a burden on somebody or you say, well, I called this person yesterday. I can't call them today again. So you tend to close yourself off and just kind of deal with stuff by yourself and being alone. And that is truly, you know, detrimental to your health. And it also affects the people around you. So it's really important for, for people with lupus to understand that your loved ones, they want to be there. They want to be able to support you. Your friends want to be there. They want to be able to support you. So it's about kind of educating them in order for them to understand what you're truly feeling and what you're truly going through and then letting them know that that's where that support system is really important for them because this is a disease that no one, no one can deal with on their own. You just can't. I mean, you think you can, up into a certain level. And then when something truly big happens or you just get to that breaking point, that's when you realize that you need that support system. And life's a lot easier if you've got that in place already. Yes, yes definitely. And if they don't have it in place, that's where the Lupus Foundation of America can, can truly help them. You know, because we can give them those resources and we can help to educate them if they need different ways to be able to speak to their families in order to get that support or if they need resources out in the community to have that support if they don't have anyone else who is in direct contact with them. So now if someone wants to get in touch with the Lupus Foundation of America, Pacific Northwest Chapter, how do they find them? Um, you can definitely, we have a Facebook page, number one, which many people seem to hit on that. So mm -hmm. if you want to go to that and like that, we appreciate it. And that would be the Lupus Foundation of America Pacific Northwest Chapter Facebook page. We also have a 1-800 number, which is 877-774-2992 that they can call. And that's also a hotline that they can call if they just have any questions about lupus or anything of that sort. And they can also go to our website, which is www lupuspnw.org. Well, Lori, thank you so much for sharing from your heart today. I really appreciate it. It has been a pleasure spending time with you. Well, thank you so much, Shelly. I appreciate you, and I appreciate James Kruger, who is also from Flow Motion Studios, for helping us today in getting this streamlined out to everybody so they can be able to see it. Absolutely. Thanks right. again. Thank you. Ugh. You wonderful woman. Thank you. Thank you.